The Quiet Warrior Show, where we help top leaders find their pathway to incredible success and a lifetime of happiness. Here is your host, Tom Dutta, The Quiet Warrior. Well, welcome to The Quiet Warrior Show. My name is Tom Dutta. I am The Quiet Warrior. I'm excited to have on my show today, well, Mr. Tom Dutta. (laughs) Welcome to the show. I'm only kidding. Today is a solo podcast, and I want to talk to you all about how I found a single thought for my, my TED Talk. Yes, I'm really excited. Three days ago, an email arrived, and it said, congratulations, you've been selected for TEDx Bear Creek Park. On February 29th, 2020, I will be standing on a red dot on a stage, looking out into the audience with the bright lights on me. Some 1,100 people are expected to be there and do the talk of my life. What I wanted to share with you today is the excitement, but also the backstory. You know me, I talk about the hero's journey narrative, and it's not about success. It's about failure along the way. If I was to come up with a through line for today's podcast, and by the way, a through line is something you have to have if you do a TED Talk. If you can just picture an image of two people standing about 10 feet apart holding a clothesline, and maybe that clothesline is drooping a little bit, it's not taut, and in between there's clothes pegs that are holding up uh, little images. These are little pieces of, of the speech or the talk that I'm going to give. And as we're telling those little stories along the way, we're traveling down that line and we're continuing to connect back to that line. There's a common theme that runs through that talk and it's called the through line. You get the picture? (laughs) All right. So fail fast, fail often, and fail forward, never giving up. That's the through line for today. Now, somebody said that to me a long time ago and it wasn't lost on me. It's been something that has driven me through my life. There are many times that we have things that happen where we have setbacks, we fail, and well, we don't move forward. And doing a TED Talk is exactly like that. I want to start off by telling you a bit about TED so you understand if you're listening to this podcast why it's such a big deal for me. And TED stands for Technology, uh, Education, and Design. The TED started, I believe, from what I know, many, many years ago where a group of people from these industries would get together, I believe, in the Silicon Valley area, in the United States, Western United States. They would get together, mastermind, brainstorm about ideas, and well, hoping that greatness would come out of that. What I understand is it didn't really take off the way they wanted, and it morphed, however, into what we know today as TED. Chris Anderson, who's the leader of the company, and it's a not-for-profit, TED is a not-for-profit, took it to where it is today. Now, you can find his TED Talk about doing a great talk. It's really fascinating. Uh, Basically, TED now on its global platform, meaning its global website, will get some 2 billion hits a year. And there's speakers all over the world that make it onto the TED stage. TED decided because of its success that it wanted to expand globally. Now, if you have a company and you want to expand globally, what do you do? Well, you you can open up in different regions or you could establish partnerships. What TED does, which is brilliant, is they started giving licenses to local curators. These are people who got the licenses to do an independently run TED Talk. It all feeds back into the main TED theme. And many of the TED speakers who end up on the main TED stage, which actually is once a year in Vancouver, and it's an an event that's very hard to get into. But many of the speakers just start off in the independent stages and their way up into the big stage. What does being a TED speaker mean? Well, it means that you have a single idea worth sharing. It has to be an idea that hasn't been thought of before, or if it is an older idea, you have to demonstrate the new twist. And I thought, well, this is going to be easy. I'll just go for it. (laughs) It didn't quite work that way. So I digress, and let me carry on here. Now that you know a little bit about TED, it's exciting. Let me get back into the story. Around fall of 2017, I was, I was actually filming what we call B footage. You know the movie industry and you see in movies where they have a picture of a building in between the scenes in the movie? Now that's called B footage where they actually film things or parts of a movie. There's, there's no talking in it, just images or scenery. 
And B footage, we were filming it in Vancouver for a TV show I did called Moving America Forward. Moving America Forward is a William Shatner TV show. Most of us know William Shatner for Canadian. Uh, you know, Captain Kirk, the Starship Enterprise. He was a Trekkie. I grew up watching him. It was unbelievable. And he's done many things. And Moving America Forward is featuring entrepreneurs or people who have done things to move North America forward. I traveled to Hollywood that fall to shoot in the Illuminate Studios. And my life was moving fast. It was absolutely surreal. I'd never done anything like that before. In the fall of 2016, just a year prior to that, I was at the, the Terminal City Club in Vancouver. It's a business networking club that I'm a member and many people in business know. And I had rented a room and put 100 people in it to reveal for the first time my book, The Way of the Quiet Warrior, 90 Days to the Life You Desire. And I had just written that book and got my first 100 copies and it wasn't to be released until July 4th, 2017. Well, I thought I'd put people in a room and get the buzz going on the book and the same time I launched my company, Create. If you want to go to the website, www.create, K-R-E-A-T dot C-A. A little play on words. Why did I create an iconic brand, I call it, Create? Because after 30 years of being a leader, being an executive, I've done everything from ground floor up to CEO and chair of the board in five different sectors. I decided to become a teacher of others, to teach what I learned and to teach through some of the mistakes I made along the way. That was fabulous. So today, that's the company. During that time, my head was spinning. All of this was new, going down to Hollywood, doing B-roll shooting. What? What is all this? I had no no idea how that all went because I'd never taken the journey before. During that filming, I met Trevor. Now, Trevor is a world-class videographer. I'd never met him before, and he was actually sent to do the bee shooting, and he was a local person in Vancouver. And I was wondering, how does Hollywood find a guy like Trevor? Well, you know, you can find him. He does great work. And he said to me as he was shooting a scene where I was sitting down, I was sitting in a restaurant at the Terminal City Club, and we were mocking up me having a dinner with a potential client in my company. And this fellow I know, He's a wonderful young man. He was there and we were talking and the cameras were rolling by on these tripods that were on wheels. And and all of a sudden, Trevor said, your work is interesting, Tom. You should talk to the curator of a TED event that's being organized. Now, the TED event that was being organized was called TEDx White Rock. And uh, it, was, it was to have the big stage event spring 2018. So let's stop there for a minute so we can catch up here. Here we are filming B footage in the fall of 2017. And somebody says to me, you should apply to be a TED speaker. Now I'd heard of TED. I've watched lots of TED talks. I'd never really considered doing it. With so much going on in my life, like all of us, I said, I don't don't really have time, but it wasn't on my radar. Well, that led to in the fall of 2017, not too long after I went to an information session. And when I walked in the room, it was in this place in White Rock, there was a hundred people. There was tables everywhere. It was around the seasonal time, Christmas, so they had everything decorated up. The energy was there. I had fear and excitement at the same time. And I had no solid idea of what I was going to do for a TED Talk. The reality is I stumbled in like most people who hear about it for the first time. Moving fast after that, we were given applications. I put this idea together. I thought, this can't be hard. I've done this before. You know, I used to go to board meetings or emergency presentations. As a CEO and business executive, I was called to speak with little notice. I always pulled it off. If you talk to my wife, Anna, she'll tell you there were many nights where I sat in my chair at the end of the night writing my talk points on cards or putting together a PowerPoint with some points so that I could, I could do a presentation. And I don't like the saying, fake it till you make it, but I always pulled it off. However, after sending in your application, we were told that the short list of 25 will be released. And well, I was shortlisted. I was so excited. I was shortlisted and they said, you have to come and, and do an audition. Once you're shortlisted, and I believe there was almost 100 applications. So I was already humbled and grateful, but the fear factor went up. They say, here, you pick a time and you are given 15 minutes. They don't tell you what to do other than come in and convince us why you should be on the stage. 
They also told me that you have 10 minutes to present your talk in a condensed version. No props. We don't have time to set up technology. And then there's five minutes Q&A. Now, if you haven't done one of these before, it's surreal because if you make the final 12 speakers, which generally is what the event is, they notify the speakers, but the rest, they don't. They just can't go back to everybody and explain why. It just isn't something that's done. They encourage you to stay part of the next event or maybe look around for another stage. I want to tell you that the TEDx Bear Creek Park event, and I'll more, more on that later, but tell you that this will be the largest event. We call it a premier event in Western Canada based on the size of the stage. When a TED event is done, the curator of the event, the organizer, has to get a license from TED. And there's a lot you have to go through to demonstrate that you're capable of doing one of these events. They're world-class events. Well, the first time you do one, you're only allowed to have up to 100 people in the audience. After that, there's many more things you have to do, including attending the, the big TED-organized event, which is in Vancouver each year, as I mentioned. But you have to go through these process to get a license. Well, the curator of TEDx Bear Creek Park got a license to be at the Bell Center for the Arts with 1,100 people audience. Spectacular. I'm excited and I'm, I'm fearful. So I'm shortlisted and unexpectedly the phone rings and that was late in the year. The phone rings and it's my mom and she says, Tom, it's your mom. My Uncle Tom had texted me before that phone call saying, I think there's been an emergency call your mother. So I called my mom and it was late December in 2017. And she said, honey, I don't know how to tell you this, but your father's died. And it rocked me. It stopped me in my tracks. I'm getting emotional telling you about it again. You can find a podcast that I've, re I've done called the, the Lessons Learned from the Death of My Father. But it was unexpected and no one knew. The funeral was actually set for the week of the audition, in, which was in the new year. And we set the date of my dad's funeral so that I could actually go and fulfill my wish to do my TED Talk audition. When you do an audition, because you've worked for months, my family supported me. Well, I went into that room that day and I did my audition. And I remember going into that room and making the sign of the cross on my chest, looking up, saying, Dad, this is for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it. And, and, and I failed. Uh, I didn't get shortlisted. My reason at the time was I was a basket case in my head. How could I deliver an audition when my father died and his funeral was that same day? How could I, how could I even be successful? At least that's the story that I was telling myself. The organizers, the judges, they knew about my dad's death. They said, hey, why don't you do a video? You don't have to come in, do your funeral, or, or, or perhaps consider coming next year. And there was something in me that said, no, I'm doing this one. I'm doing it for dad. Well, fail fast, fail off, and fail forward and never give up. The curators, understanding that I didn't make it, were, were so amazing and empathetic. They invited me to sit on the sidelines for the rehearsal of this big event. And so there I was. I walked in, and this was so many months later, and I watched 12 speakers go across the stage at a place called Blue Frog Studios, Blue Frog Studios out in White Rock, British Columbia really cool place. It was surreal. I had all these mixed emotions. I was like a sponge. Ste several speakers became mentors to me after that. Uh, I couldn't wait to apply again. I was sitting there saying, I want to be on that stage. All in all, in the back of my mind, knowing I'm, I've just processed the death of my dad and, and I don't know what the next six months even means in my life. I began realizing that this wasn't as easy as I thought. After sitting in the audience and watching these speakers, and what they went through over four or six months to get ready for that day, you have to deliver the talk of a lifetime. And I started realizing there's something more special. I want to tell you now, if you're wanting to be a speaker, speaking in business from PowerPoint slides, from scripts, even when you look at politicians, they read from prepared speeches and, and scripts. There is nothing like standing on a stage, like a TED stage, speaking from your heart for 10 to 15 minutes without a script. Knowing how to speak professionally on that stage is so much more, so much more I didn't really know. Well, 
I want to take you forward now. The next many months in 2018, remember, I've just sat and watched the TED event that I was supposed to or hoping to be on. You never know. My dad had died and it was turmoil. I was still processing the loss of him. And there's a bigger story there. And I think many of you know, I made peace with my dad. It wasn't an early good beginning in my life, but it was just months before his death unexpectedly that I had met him at a Starbucks and had some coffee and there was forgiveness and tears and I hadn't seen him for many years. We agreed to start meeting in the new year once a month for coffee and then he was gone. I was disappointed that I failed him on the TED stage and I would start training to try and get past this. I said to myself, I need to find something new to do. When was the last time, everyone, you did something for the first time? I think that's a tough mutter line. So I started training in the summer for what was called the Ride to Conquer Cancer. Wow, 225 kilometers on my bicycle, August 25th and 26th, the fall of 2018. That's what I was training for. A good friend of mine sadly lost his beautiful daughter at age two to leukemia. I had done some training for his company, trained his management team. He became a friend. He was in a peer group I ran. I was the chair of his executive peer group. And he told me the story one day and he told me he had a team of 80 riders. And I'd never heard of the Ride to Conquer Cancer in this way. I said, I'm in. I want to ride for your daughter. But I soon learned that my wife's best friend, Lucy, died of cancer. And she was a girlfriend that my wife knew since the early days. And there were others that I knew who had passed from cancer or were fighting cancer. I was all excited. I trained hard. I arrived in peak condition mentally and physically. The training was incredibly hard. <laughs> so I did the first day. It was from Vancouver up to, to Hope. And they changed the route because of all the forest fires that were burning. It was a bad summer on the side of the roads. They changed the route from Vancouver. We left from what's called the Cloverdale Fairgrounds. I never forget that morning. 12 to 1,500 cyclists on their bikes as the sun was coming up big stage, media, and as they were kicking it off, they said as we sat on our bikes with adrenaline, look to your left and look to your right and look for people who have flags on their bikes. And by the way, those people are either battling or have survived cancer. And I went, oh my gosh, now life is in perspective. Here I am riding past people. I have nothing to complain about. Well, I did the first day, 100 kilometers. It was exciting. And that night we stayed in a motel. In the town of Chilliwack, we were put up there by our team. My wife was with me and I stepped in the bathtub and my feet went out. It was slippery. I fell. I cracked the tub with my head. That was not part of the plan. It was the first time in my life I discovered I had a brain injury. I want to tell you that that night I, I sat up in my bed in the motel, excruciating pain, chewing Tylenol. Couldn't lie down because my head was pounding. And the next day, my wife said, cancel out. And I said, no, I'm not going to let my team down. I got up at 4 a.m., no sleep, got on my bike and rode another 100K. And I remember saying to myself that people who have cancer going through chemo and treatments, they don't have a choice. But I do. And I can do this ride. And remember, at that point, I didn't know I had a concussion or a brain injury. My first one. So in fall of 2018, in the midst of this concussion, I, I apply again for TED. I remember saying to myself, oh my gosh, I had cycled all summer. I had buried my dad, processed his estate. We had difficult challenges in our family around that. It was surreal. My business had come to a halt. And there I was, peak condition, riding the ride. My big plan was after this ride, I'm going to take my medal and ride into the sunset, no pun intended. And then I'm going to get on my next ride and that's do my TED Talk audition. And this time I'm, I'm going to win. I'm going to do it for my dad. But no, I'm going to do it for myself and to change the world. <laughs> and, and I did. I applied. The location shifted to what's called Bear Creek Park. I was so excited. It was White Rock before. That's what I knew. But this time it was Bear Creek Park. Bear Creek Park, by the way, is in Surrey, British Columbia, one of the biggest cities in Western Canada or in North America, I'm told, the fastest growing. Incredible place. And so exciting because I grew up in that hood that's my hood. I, my bicycle on the, the rubberized track, I never remember or never forget. I was a kid. My dad was pushing me on my bicycle. I had the training wheels on. 
and it was a summer day. The sun was shining on a rubberized track, cedar trees all around, this beautiful place called Bear Creek Park. And my dad took my training wheels off, and that was the day I learned to ride my bike. It's one of the great memories I have of my father. And if you know my, my story as a child, it wasn't good. So there I was. So now it's like, oh my gosh, the, the heavens have parted. There's a meaning. The universe is bringing Tom his TED Talk at Bear Creek Park. I got to be on that stage. By the way, the community of Surrey has many South Asian people, many all cultures, but that's my background. I thought this truly is home. In fact, my first job while I was in high school was filing tax returns at the Surrey Tax Center just off King George Highway, they call it. I used to go to the Dell Hotel and throw darts with my friend Al late at night after work. It was just a great time. Great time really trying to escape what was going on in my life at home, but it was a lot of fun being out and about. Never believing that I couldn't make it, and after failing my first TED Talk, I applied. I auditioned, and guess what? Well, I auditioned because I was shortlisted again. And I won't get into the whole story. I'm going to wind you forward. But my second application was a different idea. And this time, I decided the idea was going to be about forgiveness. Because I had just met with my dad before he died and we had forgiveness. And the idea was to show how forgiveness can be done and can free you. And how authenticness as a leader comes from processing past issues. We can show up and be authentic as a CEO, a entrepreneur, a business owner, manager, employee. We can be authentic when we show up as our true selves. And forgiving my dad, receiving that freed him of his pain and helped me move forward. It was unbelievable. That was my big idea. But it's how I did it, meeting my dad at Starbucks, hearing his story about his own father and his childhood, understanding why he brought that into my life and hurt me. And then we took a selfie photo and I blew that up into the size of a 55-inch TV. I had it laminated and I walked in that theater that day proud. (laughs) And I remember putting it on the side of the stage and the audience, the judges, some 20 people looked at me and this was a beautiful theater again in a retirement village that would look like just a real theater. And there I was and well, I put dad on the stage and I made the sign of the cross in my mind and I said, dad, this one's for you. It was like deja vu. And well, as I did the talk, you must know that I had headaches. I had what's called brain fog. My brain couldn't focus. My eyes were blurry. I had trouble with my fatigue and energy. And I was faking it. I never told anybody. I thought, they think from last time, they know my dad died. This time, I'm not going to be weak. I'm not going to show cracks. I'm just going to tell them, this is my talk. But I was faking it. I had a concussion. I had what we know today was a debilitating brain injury that I'm still recovering from. So there I was, and guess what? (laughs) I got the call. Well, I got the email, and it said, congratulations to these speakers. And I looked, and I thought, well, maybe the fog in my head, I just can't see clearly. And I was nervous and on adrenaline and anxiety, and I looked again, and my name wasn't on it. Fail fast. Fail often. Fail forward and never give up flashed through my mind again. Well, I want to tell you, everyone, that I spiraled into a cycle of depression. I I couldn't work much after that uh, due to my brain injury. More on that on another episode. But I never gave up. I believe that Ted held a place for me in my journey to help the world to do something that could change the world, to inspire people with an idea that could shift their thinking. So I was invited to the TEDx Bear Creek Park 2009 event in the spring this year. I'm recording this November the 5th, 2019. Earlier this year was the big event that I wasn't at. (laughs) This time it was different. I couldn't face to be there. I was feeling shame and failure and all these complications from my brain injury and dad had died and everything was still fresh. It was too painful and I I just didn't go. So in spring 2019, something incredible happened. And they say, God, you know, sometimes God puts people in your path for a reason. Well, I always knew I was going to try again for Ted. Remember now, twice I didn't make it. Once dad died, second time brain injury. That was what I thought. And then somebody called me. It was the curator, the big organizer, the person who held the license. This was an important person who knew me from my auditions. 
and said, Tom, I've got somebody I want you to talk to. And next thing you know, I'm talking to, and I won't tell you her name because I'd like to interview her because she's an incredible woman. But she says, I want to spend some time with you. So she was a coach for speaking. And this wasn't an average coach. This this woman, we'll call her Mrs. T. <laughs> she has a website. I went to it and it's like, wow, she won the number two spot in the world championships for speaking. She'd been a speaker all over the world and she mentored and coached people. But she had a very diverse background. And she was an entrepreneur. She had other businesses and interests. I thought, Back to my CEO days, CEOs, when I was successful, it's because I surrounded myself by people smarter than me. You hear what I'm saying there? When you become real as a leader, you surround yourself by people smarter than you because you know that you need to learn more. Famous basketball coach John Wooden once said, it's what we learn after we know it all that really makes a difference. And I thought, this is a gift. Now, remember, I'm not feeling great, so I meet Mrs. T., She's busy working with the events and we met at my Terminal City Club. It's a place I go for business networking in downtown Vancouver. And I said, sure, I'll meet you. And we picked a date and it was in the spring of this year, 2019. I said, it it couldn't hurt. I sucked it up. (laughs) And I went, I sat down with her and it was incredible. For two hours, I believe that day we talked. And for the first time, I did a lot of talking, but I was very revealing. I talked about everything. And she says, Tom, I want to I wanna just talk to you. I want to be with you. I want to hear how you talk. I want to listen to what you're thinking. She said, I know your background. I've read your book. I know what you did with Ted before. And we need to peel back all those layers and find that true idea, that needle in the haystack, that real Tom. I'm looking at her going like, what the heck are you talking about? Find the real Tom. This is me. I've written a book. I've gone deep over the last 10 years. I put it out there. Well, guess what? Nobody had ever challenged me that way. And I said, I'd like to work with you. So I engaged her for six months in a contract to be my speaking coach. Now, just remember, this was not yet the application for the next TED. This was me saying, I want to grow and learn and fix what went wrong. I want to learn so that I can be successful next time. I'm not well. I've got this concussion, this brain injury. My business has slowed down. I'm struggling with so many things. This was the last thing my doctors, my neurologist, My psychologist said, don't pressure yourself and do too much. My friends were saying, "Uh uh-uh, Tom, you need to sort of slow down. Something was driving me. Fail fast, fail often, fail forward and never give up. Just kept playing in my mind. So we started working together in the spring and I knew that that six months would end right about the time the next application process started for my not one, no two, but third TED application. Now, I got to tell you, there's a lot of speakers and a lot of people who I've heard say, Ted's on my bucket list. I want to do it. And they say, I want to, I want to, but they never do it. There's many people who attend their first and don't make it. And I don't know if they show up to do the next one or they keep trying. I don't know. I'm just assuming that anybody in their soul has a purpose for doing a TED Talk and it needs to be beyond your ego, yourself, something that you have to help the world. You're going to keep trying and you'll get it. And there's many TED stages. You can keep trying at different ones. Just so it turns out in Western Canada, this is the only biggest one. Well, on one of the early conference calls, I want to take you into the world of coaching for a minute and get personal. On one of the early coaching conference calls, you have to picture that we're coaching now through Zoom video. I'm on my Microsoft Surface in my living room. I have a baseball cap on, dark shades, and maybe. I'm sitting there drinking a lot of water and this Mrs. T is on the other end. I see her. We see each other on the video. That's it. That's how we're coaching. Why am I wearing a cap? Why am I wearing dark sunglasses? Because one of the challenges is when I landed on my head, the part of the brain that controls eyesight, it got hurt. My eyes, even today, don't adjust to the light. It causes bad headaches, blurry fog. Even now, talking on the mic If I was having to read something, it would go in and out and would lack a focus. So something wasn't right. But as we were on that talk, uh, I revealed or divulged something. I believe it was the third time we did a session. We were meeting every week. I divulged something that I hadn't told anybody before outside of my marriage to Anna. Something that was occurring in my life at that time because of the injury and all the things going on. And that was the breakthrough. Oh my God, there was this breakthrough. 
And what it was is my coach inspired me to share that part of my life and story for the first time. How did that happen? Well, we were talking and she was telling me about some experiences she had in her life. And I found one needle in her story that connected to mine. And all of a sudden it felt safe to talk about what I wanted to share. Have you ever had that happen where you feel you will have something that maybe people are going to judge you on? You can't talk about it. But when you find somebody who you look at and you go, they're just like me because they shared something similar, all of a sudden it comes out. It was at that moment, everybody, when I realized it was safe to share what I wanted to share. It came out. And from that point, it was magical. We talked and talked. My talk was written. We collaborated. I ended up with this awesome application that we entered. And guess what? I was shortlisted from whatever the numbers were to 25. And my audition was just a couple weeks or so ago. I went into that audition and I tracked it by logging on my fridge with little tick marks each day. I rehearsed my talk some 61 times. Going back to audition, everybody, what I told you is when you go into audition, you have 15 minutes, 10 minutes, do your condensed talk, no props, five minutes Q&A. You're fearful. You're scared. You want to throw up as you stand on that stage. I sat in my car that morning on the side of the road in South Surrey or White Rock, they call it, at that same theater, that gorgeous theater. And all I could think about was my dad dying that time and missing twice and being on the stage and all the negative talk. And I, I kept working and convincing myself, fail fast, fail off and fail forward. Don't give up. You have something special here and this is your time. Even though I had a brain injury and I didn't tell them about it, I was prepared to go in there and kick butt. And I was feeling off because something had happened the night before. If, if you think the story is even this weird, here I am sitting in my car in the morning on a Saturday, beautiful, sunny October, spectacular weather in Western Canada here, getting ready to go on a stage and do my third audition for my TED Talk. The night before I was parked, I drive a four-door sedan BMW white, parked in a parking lot for Costco. Daylight, somebody hit and run my car and took the front right end off, right corner off it. <laughs> oh my God, there's thousands of cars in the Costco parking lot. Why did they have to pick mine and why did they have to do that the night before I was expecting to get the results of my TED audition? Why? I kept asking myself. Then I realized from my faith that God says, don't try to figure that out because he knows why. He knows why and you just have to trust. I trust my faith. So I remember saying that this is a distraction for a reason. Well. On the 2nd of November, the email came that I'd waited for for several years. It said, we were impressed with the quality of your application, the quality of your presentation. Congratulations. You have been selected as one of the speakers for the TEDx Bear Creek Park event, February 29th, 2020. My heart stopped. I jumped with joy. I started crying with emotion inside. I didn't even know how to react. It wasn't the fact that I was chosen, everyone. It was the reality that I had failed fast, failed often, and never gave up. That made it so sweet. I remember looking up at the sky and doing the cross, sign of the cross, saying, Dad, I did it. And just so you know, this isn't the hard work. Now the hard work starts. When you get accepted for a TED Talk, you have almost about four months, and they say about 100 hours of work to do. Rehearsal, there's four days of coaching. You're assigned a coach. Good TED events provide you with coaching. It's intense. We were told if you're not prepared to make this your number one priority, put everything aside. You're going to be annoying your friends and family talking about this over and over and over again. You're going to be delivering your talk to people you know. You're going to talk about it in your sleep. If you're not prepared to do that, then don't apply. Of course, I was. So what is the moral of all of this? I said at the beginning of the talk and branded this talk as you know, maybe there's a twist in the story about some truth. The moral of the story is that what did I discover? Well, the truth is that my dad's death, the concussion, were just bullshit stories that I was telling myself and telling others. In one coaching session, it was surreal, as Mrs. T said. She told me this. She said, I spoke to the judges who saw your last audition, the one I did the year before. She said, I wasn't in the room but she said, I'm your coach and I'm here to give you feedback. And she said, in the first two minutes of your talk, Tom, they didn't like you. She said, I didn't like you when I read the script of your talk. I was shocked. 
in the back of my mind, I've had this thought why I ought to, and I was going to punch her through my Microsoft service. Of course, I thought then again, well, wait a minute, that's a $2,000 screen to fix. No, I don't don't think I'll do that. (laughs) But I was shocked. How can this be? I was hurt. My, My ego was bruised. You didn't like me? I was talking about my dad. I was talking about forgiveness. I had a picture of my dad on the stage. I was just talking about the truth of life. But this wasn't the first time in my life I'd heard things that I didn't want to hear. If you read my book, you'll know all about my journey. And like most people in life, even as leaders, we have blind spots. We don't always want to hear things. That's part of the growth, isn't it? Right? That's part of resilience. Like my mom told me when, as a kid, I was picked on in school for being South Asian, you know, having brown skin, black hair. My mom used to say, you're better than that. And I always carried my armor. I carried this armor to protect myself from the outside world because because I thought that's what I had to do to be loved, to be successful. I had to be tough. Couldn't show cracks. When I became a CEO, you can't talk about your weaknesses. People will think you're going to crack and crumble into this emotional puddle, incapable, unreliable, maybe broken. I was, that was the breakthrough. And this is what I want to tell you. The breakthrough was ego to egoless. Let me say that again. I went from ego to egoless. The lesson I want you to get is that TED is a major, major opportunity and a privilege. When you get into a TED Talk, they tell you it's a privilege that you deserve. It's a privilege and it can open doors to the world with a single thought you have worth sharing that could shift thinking and create or change something in the world. It's very hard to be successful, if you've heard me say, and get on a stage. But here's the thing. The real reason was my ego was in the way. It wasn't my dad's death. It wasn't the concussion. I was always the CEO, the top guy. By nature of that work, I had the spotlight on me all the time. I always found a way to be successful. I was always climbing the ladder, trying to be an overachiever, really to to maybe put back in me what was missing, which was true happiness. But I had this chip on my shoulder and I came across as egocentric. If you stand on a TED stage, by the way, and you talk about your book or your accomplishments, you never make it. There's a, there's a rule in TED, no selling from the stage. I had a client the other day say, well, when you get on stage, will you talk about my company? And I said, no. I said, that's an ego. I said, they won't allow that. Can you imagine if TED people had eight to 10 to 12 minutes to do the talk of their lifetime to connect and influence the minds and hearts of others. And they were doing a promotion about their own work or your company. I showed up in, in that first two auditions. I didn't let people see the real Tom, but when that armor cracked and came off and the real me emerged, which was through the power of coaching, she pulled the real Tom out of me. And that is what got me to the final speakers list. Before I wrap up, I want to say something about coaching. I do coaching. I coach others. Whether you're working in a leadership role, you're a coach of others, whether you do it for paid money. The, the metaphor here is when someone coaches you, they're able to make you uncomfortable. They're able to show you the mirror and bring out of you things you can't see. If you can make the connection here, how can you come up with an idea worth spreading that's going to change the world when maybe it's buried in you and you can't see it? Maybe it's buried behind ego. How can you do that? Well, getting somebody who can coach you can help you find that. I did all the work. Mrs. T just held up the mirror, heard me speak, and had me reflect and find it. Now, don't get me wrong. My talk is strong. You'll see or hear it February 29th, 2020. I'll be on stage at the Bell Center for the Performing Arts, and then it's recorded, and it'll be on social media and on the, on the platforms. My talk, is about leadership and mental health with a call to action that I believe is going to rock the world. But I was told by my coach who was in the theater that day of my audition that for the first time, the judges saw a side of me that was real and authentic, that they hadn't seen before. And let me tell you that if you're a leader or you're somebody out there trying to inspire others to follow you in your life, in relationships, business, doesn't matter. When the real you comes out, and you park the ego at the door, life changes everything. I parked my ego. I failed fast. I failed often. I failed forward. And I never gave up. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that tickets for TEDx Bear Creek Park will go on sale soon. 
mid-November to the end is pre-sell, which means preferred seating. Our website is www.tedxbearcreekpark.ca. You can go there, get all the details and keep up to date. Check out my social media posts and you'll stay up to date as well. I hope to fill the audience with good people that want to learn and grow, people that are coming to be part of a shift in thinking. Thank you very much. I, I just realized I doubled time today. I lost control of 40 minutes and it was exciting to share that. The real work now begins as I put this microphone down. I begin the 100 hours of hard work to get ready to deliver the talk of my life to shift the thinking of people in that audience. Everybody, find your true passion and purpose like I have with my TED Talk. Live that life that you deserve and desire. And find this show on your favorite podcast channel. Perhaps it's iTunes. Subscribe to it so you get the weekly releases. Give it a high rating if you can, if you like it. It helps me get the word out. Have an awesome day. Thank you for listening to The Quiet Warrior Show. Create is a motive-based leadership development firm. www.kreat.ca